Boom. <clears throat> so there were a lot of great speakers and teaching that took place. I absorbed a whole lot. Um, one of the things that really stuck out to me, and uh, Prophet Adia, she was saying it just even during praise and worship, and she was talking about our tongues. And for me, it really um, stuck with me. No matter, I kept trying to look for other things to teach on, but I'm like, you know, God kept bringing it back to me. And he um, helped me to understand that MBDM Des Moines recently went through a really big time where a lot of people receive their tongues. And I'm not sure if you all um, really understand what it is that you received. So, um, so there's times when apostle will say, you know, pray in your heavenly language. And it's like very few, very little, but I know a lot of you have them. So um, can anybody tell me, not the leaders, but what um, speaking in tongues is? So speaking in tongues is a spiritual gift. The gift of speaking in tongues was given to believers to aid in the building up of the body of Christ. The gift of speaking in tongues is the ability to pray and praise God in a heavenly dialect, possibly even an angelic language, possibly not known of the earth. The Holy Spirit personally crafts or creates a special and unique language that enables a Christian to speak to God in prayer, praise, and thanksgiving. This gift is spirit empowered to speak meaningful words that are only understood by the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, unless God provides the interpretation through one speaking or through another believer. Also, there are times when we go from just praying in tongues to warring in tongues. You will notice that they will come out differently, and it's almost like your spirit will raise up inside of you, and there is a higher level of authority that will come with you or your tongues at that time. So what are our tongues used for? Kind of went over that briefly, but Paul states in 1 Corinthians 14 and 4, he who speaks in tongues edifies himself. And edification means the instruction or improvement of a person morally or intellectually. Edification is a good thing. We are actually commanded to do so in Jude uh, verse 20. But ye beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto an eternal life. And in 1 Corinthians 14 and 14, Paul says that the one who speaks in tongue speaks not to men, but to God, which signifies that tongues is a form of prayer. Amen. So speaking in tongues helps express what is in your spirit, which cannot be expressed in words. Also, speaking in tongues can ben also benefit the body of Christ if there is an interpreter present. Some people say that you are not to use your tongues in front of others based on this scripture. 1 Corinthians 14, 26 to 27. Well, my brothers and sisters, let's summarize. When you meet together, one will sing, another will teach, another will tell some special revelation God has given, one will speak in tongues, and another will interpret what is said. But everything that is done must strengthen all of you. No more than two or three should speak in tongues. They must speak one at a time, and someone must interpret what they are saying. It has been said... And continues to be said that one should not speak um, in their tongues in front of others. But if you are praying, worshiping, or thanking God in your tongues with the body, it is okay. The issue comes into play if you are standing before the body or praying only in tongues without an interpreter. Mm. So again, tongues are used to edify both yourself and the body. Amen. When used in this way, the gifts of tongues should be used to emphasize and support the spiritual message and not be led by emotions. This will help edify others. 1 Corinthians 12 and 7 says, a spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. There are occurrences in the book of Acts in which people were baptized with the Holy Spirit, spoke in tongues at the same time. This occurred most notably on the day of Pentecost when the baptism of the Holy Spirit was given for the first time. Um, Acts 2, verse 1 through 4, on the day of Pentecost, all believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames of tongue, a fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. During this time, the tongues that they received were different than heavenly languages because each one heard in their own language. And let's see, so I'm going to read um, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12 through 14. 
But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Since they are spiritually discerned, or in other words, discerned by God's Spirit, which the enemy does not have, we can rest in confidence that our communication is privileged and not disclosed to the enemy's camp. Lastly on my list is speaking in tongues for everyone. Yes, it is. According to Mark chapter 16, verse 15 through 17, which reads, And he told them, Go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. Anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved, but anyone who refuses to believe will be condemned. These miraculous signs will accompany those who believe. They will cast out demons in my name, and they will speak in new languages. Amen. So in closing, for those of you who have your tongues or who are seeking God for your tongues, remember, you are never too old or too young to receive that gift. When you do have them, do not be afraid to use them, as it reads in 1 Corinthians 14 and 2. For if you have the ability to speak in tongues, you will be talking only to God. Since people won't be able to understand you, you will be speaking by the power of the Spirit, but it will be all, but it will be, all be mysterious. Amen. 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 Hi guys. Um, I'm gonna stay down here because I gotta see my PowerPoint. So, <laughs> okay. So I did my teach back on. I did my teach back on a quote that Dr. Price had. Uh, she's a writer and an author, so of course she had like several quotable, qu- quotable things, and she dropped a lot of gems. So I would say this is the one that I did mine on. If you choke the seed, you'll kill the fruit. Okay, so. These are three questions that I'll be going over and touching on. Uh, What are the seeds? Where is the root? And how do we uproot it? Okay. So the seed versus the fruit. Um, Depression, fear, and anxiety are in fact not the seed because this is the aftermath of what you sow. Uh, The seed will be the mind, which is the thought, and the body, which is the action. And the scripture to back that up is... For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 7. Okay, what is the root? So, like Nana talks about all the time. um, I mean, sorry. Apostle talks about all the time, which is generational curses. um, Seeds that were planted before you were conceived. Uh, We never really talk about things that are spoken over us, which can also be considered generational curses. Um, generational curses aren't just actions, they can also be verbal. Um, and also definitely probably our least favorite are things that we've created on our own, um, which can definitely be the aftermath of a generational curse, but once you can identify what it is, it's no longer just something that was passed down to you, it's in fact a choice. Okay, so my last point is growth. How to uproot unwanted seeds. Um, first, of course, acknowledgement. I think a lot of us think that if we acknowledge something that we're giving it life, but we're not necessarily attaching it to us. Uh, Being able to acknowledge the seed, two, learning the difference between uprooting and suppressing. Um, They do not belong in the same sentence, are the same space. (laughs) Um, Uprooting is getting rid of something. Two, suppressing is ignoring something until it disappears. And anyone that knows how to suppress knows it doesn't disappear. Um, this is probably my least favorite, being a apostle, go back and forth about this often. Um, asking for help, I'd rather not. Um, <laughs> it doesn't take away from your wisdom or your strength. Um, they did talk about often, like, uh, you can pray and go to therapy. They're really big on, like, uh, mental health and things like that. And, of course, to back that up is plan, succeed through good counsel. Don't go to war without wise advice. Proverbs chapter twenty. 20 verse 18 and the last one of course is knowing your word um not knowing your word is denying yourself because we are uh made in his image um two is everything that you've been through has been solved before so uh it's definitely in the bible but it's also people that are near you that know young and old uh don't be afraid to ask for help and the scripture to back that up is you are an heir because you do not know the scriptures are the power of God. Matthew chapter 22, verse 29. And I'm done.
Good morning. I'm back. <laughs> um, so I had the opportunity to go to the Near Apostle Ship Summit um, a couple weeks ago, and the theme of the summit was the rise of the mighty one. And um, the one that we went to in June's theme was confronting the darkness. So there was kind of like, you know, a, um, a, a, a good connection between the two. First, you have to know what you're confronting to step into your rightful place as a mighty one. Um, they encouraged us to arise and take your place. And after this um, summit was over, we will all have a new place in God. So that was reason enough to shout, amen. Um, the goal of this year's summit was to make us aware of God's impending kingdom overhaul. Now, overhaul is defined as taking something apart in order to um, replace it. Well, take it apart to examine it and then repair what needs to be repaired. So God is going to overhaul the church. He is overhauling us. He is overhauling um, how we operate, how we um, give his word, what we know about his word. Our manifestations will be overhauled. Um, and how is he doing this? He is doing this by, as Apostle kind of talked about, he's introducing his present mind. We will begin to look like God and think like God in the earth, and he will establish his present truth within us. So he's going to be feeding us his word, and we're going to be able to receive it and do different things with it because our mind is going to be transformed in that process. Um, so what I'm, my point that I'm going to talk about more is, um, you know, when I have been one of the few that have, I feel like I go to every single <laughs> conference and because that's the place I'm in I've talked about this before I'm really chasing after what God has for me and um, so one of the things that I think Dr. Paula Price said is that good counsel is given to good stewards so Proverbs 29 and 1 talks about um, I don't know if it's up here yes I can't see it so he that being often reproved harden his neck shall suddenly be, be destroyed and that without remedy. Um, so I, for me, that kind of meant if you're not open to receiving the word, the good counsel that is given to you, um, then you will get to a place where you um, resent that word. And then you um, get to a place where you are almost um, without repair. You can't be fixed. So um, I'm going to talk about seven points that they gave us that we can use once we get a word of knowledge, once we get a word spoken to us, once, we, once God has spoken to us, what we do to take that information and to grow from it. The first one is we need to know how to receive it. So I think that's the first thing is we have to be, we have to want to receive that word. We have to be in a place where we're chasing after what God is doing in our lives. Um, and so he's going to have to do a heart work in each and every one of us to receive what he is speaking to us. Um, we also have to um, know how to view it, what you have been learned, what you're learning, that knowledge. You have to know how to view it. And I believe that is just meditating on God's word. You have to review it over and over and over again, like Joshua tells us, to meditate on God's word day and night. Um, and then we also have to um, know how we think about that knowledge. And I believe that starts with the transformation of our mind. Um, we cannot begin to process things in a different way if we're processing it with the same mind as before. Um, and then the next one leads into that is processing it. And I think we talked about this early, yesterday in the leadership team. Um, it's so important to have someone in the body that you look at as a mentor, that's your leader. And so I think that's a good person to start to process what you are hearing from God process what, like, you know, I know what this means to me. I know what I think God is saying, um, and trying to bounce that off of other people to see if you can kind of get some more revelation in that. Um, and share it. I think that is all our roles in the body of Christ to evangelize what we're hearing. Um, we need to, our founding scripture, Matthew um, 28, 19, and 20 tells us to go out into all these nations. And so that's part of our commission is to share what we are learning. We can't keep it to ourselves. The way that we go, grow is we reach one and teach one. We each have a sphere of influence, whether it's at your job, whether it's, you know, 
in your family, those people that don't even go to church, whether it's your friends. We have people that we impact that's not sitting in this building. And so our job is to share what God is doing through you. And sometimes you share not just by what you say, but how you act. Um, and then the next one is act on it. Um, and that just goes with making sure that we are just not letting that knowledge sit. We are doing something about it. We are moving from what God is showing you into making it become an action. Um, James 1, 20 through to 25 says, but be, do, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror, for he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. So I think just going in and whatever that thing is um, that God has spoken to you, you know, I feel like you know, the saying, deja vu, everybody, oh, I've, I've been in this, this happened before, I've been in this situation before, I feel like each one of us have been in a spot before in our lives where you're like, I've been in the same situation before, and that's for you to now take what God has spoke to you and act on it, do something different than what you did in the past, um, using those seven steps that might help you get to a different place, the outcome will be different, um, and then lastly, knowledge that stays dormant is not useful, so if you don't do anything with what God is speaking to you, if you're not changing, if there's not an outward call to action or there's not something that's stirring up within you to not keep doing things the way you're doing, then it's, it's all for nothing. So we just have to, my takeaway, and I encourage all of you guys to, is God is not just speaking to the leaders. He's not just speaking to the people that come up here on the pulpit. He's speaking to all of us. And so what is he speaking to you? What are you going to do? How are you going to receive it? How are you going to share it? How are you going to change the way you think about it? And then how are you going to act on it? And that's how God is going to move through each of us. So that's it. Hallelujah. I want to put that slide back up with the seven steps. Because what we're going to do is we're going to open the altar on today. But this time, I want everybody to come. And I want you to literally pray and ask the Lord, what is it that he has spoken to you? First of all, have you received it? That's the first step, is receiving it. Because what happens is, when you get a prophecy that you don't like, you discard it as no good. You discard it as they don't know what they're talking about. You discard it as I don't have to do all of that. And a lot of times what's happening is, remember I talked earlier about how there were places in my will that I chose not to submit completely to God. And so what is it that God has spoken to you that you are called to do? We have preached an entire year on being all in an entire year. If God has not spoken something to you in an entire year, you're not listening. That's impossible for him not to talk to you for an entire year. That lets me know you have turned your miracle ear off and decided that God doesn't have anything to say to you, that you're not a part of the plan. So the first thing we're going to do is say, God, I receive what you've called me to do. But then you got to look in your mind and see, how is it that you're viewing it? Are you viewing it from heaven down or are you viewing it from your perspective, earth up? How are you viewing it? If God has already endowed you with everything that you need in order to accomplish that which he's called you to do, your view needs to be like his. He's not down here looking up going, oh, Lord, can you help? Oh, you are Lord. No, he's from heaven saying, I already knew this was coming, and I know the end from the beginning. I know how this turns out. So no matter how difficult, no matter how hard, no matter how challenging it may look, there's already a solution in play, and you're part of that. 
How do you view it? What's going through your mind? What thoughts are challenging how you view things right now? Identify them and attack them with the word of God. As you're processing through this, your process needs to be looking in the word of God for how someone else has already done it. There's nothing new under the sun. And the principle is always the same for success in the kingdom of God. So all you have to do is look for the pattern in the word of God, and you'll be able to see exactly what you need to do in order to overcome this. Share it. What is my position? Who do I share it with? Now, there's some people God has not prepared to receive what you're about to talk about. You literally got to ask the Lord, who's ready? And then you cannot be afraid. You've got to have courage enough to go to that person and share what God has said. We were in a Waffle House. They can tell you. We went in there and flipped that Waffle House upside down. We didn't care. We didn't care it was a Waffle House. We didn't care them people still had to cook our food. We prayed for them people, broke stuff off of them people. The last Waffle House we went to, the people couldn't even uh, cook the food. They were sitting there crying when we left. We don't care that it's a Waffle House. We go in there and we do what God has told us to do. That's how you have to think. And anybody who travels with me will let you know. That is what I expect. If God says you're supposed to pray for a person, the woman started manifesting right there in the middle of Waffle House. Terry said, oh, my, we need to get up out of here. Uh-uh, we don't run from the fire. We run into the fire. We're the water. Understand who you are. Identity is the key to your destiny. We don't run from it. We run into it because we are the solution God created to deal with whatever it is. So who is it that you're supposed to share it with? That young lady had no hope. That young lady had been contemplating suicide. She had lost her children and didn't know what she was going to do with herself. And next minute, you know, I didn't even start this one. My leaders did. Hallelujah. My leaders was like, I got to get to that one. I was like, go ahead. I got your back. And they went and they did what they needed to do. And I stood back and dared anything to come at them. I watched and prayed. And that's what's supposed to happen. It should not always be me. If God has placed something on the inside of you and called you to do something, you have a responsibility to do it. My job is to be that grandma. While I was at the conference, that was what she called me. She said, you've become a big mama. And she said, a big mama watches the children as they move into the position that she was once in. It took me a minute to catch on to that until I thought about Waffle House. Because the first Waffle House, I went and flipped it. This Waffle House, y'all did. Amen? Amen. So sharing it acting on it. This can't be a one-time thing. We've got to get to the place where acting on it becomes a natural part of who we are. That it's perpetual. That there's some continuum there. Because what we do is we think God just does this one miracle thing and we sit and we marvel over what God did and we tell everybody about that one thing that he did. But that should be a natural part of your life. We are miracle workers. We have been placed in this earth to show the world who he is. And if that's who we are, it should not be a one-time event. There has to be some continuum. If we're still in the earth, that means we still have ability. We still have purpose. We still have something that he needs us to do. Otherwise, he would have taken us on the glory by now. Our job is done. Well done, thy good and faithful servant. So I'm going to open this altar. Now, for those who know that they need to rededicate their life again, come see me up here. I'm going to have a few of us up here that's going to be praying for those who need to rededicate their life and to shift yourself back into position. Because what's getting ready to come on the horizon, you don't want to miss. I'm not going to come with the gloom and doom and the scary. You already know what comes with getting out of the will of God. I don't need to do that. 
And, and some of you, God has really been pulling. I can feel it. There's been like this tug in you, but you've been over here doing something else, and the enemy's been tempting you with something else that feels good. But it's not working out for your good. You're here for a reason today, amen? And you, you know who I'm talking to because God's already dealing with you on it. So I'm going to stand up here. Uh, Lashelle, Rhonda, you got a baby, amen? So the rest of you, we're going to play something soft. <laughs> 